You may remember this interview from 2015 between CNN's Don Lemon and human rights lawyer Arslan Iftikhar. They're discussing the aftermath of the terrorist attacks in Paris that happened that year, and the interview kind of takes an odd turn, as you'll see. What is your reaction to what happened, Arslan? Well, I, I think, you know, like millions and billions of people around the world, we were shocked and horrified to see what happened today at the offices of Charlie Hebdo in, in Paris. And, uh, you know, it's something that is against any normative teaching of Islam or any religious teaching, and it's a crime against humanity and an act of mass murder. I think that if you, you know, surveyed the vast majority of Muslims around the world, uh, you know, they would certainly say that, uh, you know, the killing of innocent civilians is, is not only, uh, you know, murder, but it's also against any normative mainstream teachings of Islam. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, their acts are about as Muslim as abortion clinic bombers or gay nightclub bombers are acts are Christian. Yeah. Would you describe those support who support ISIS? ISIS as Islamic extremists. Do you support ISIS? Wait, did you just ask if I support ISIS? Wait, did you just ask if I support ISIS? You can see the surprise on his face. I mean, how many other human rights lawyers, people who, who devote their lives to pursuing justice and trying to make sure that everyone is treated fairly with dignity and equanimity, like how many other people in Iftikhar's position would be asked if they have ISIS sympathies. I mean, I mean, really? This question clearly caught Iftikhar off guard, and, and he says as much in his book entitled Scapegoats, How Islamophobia Helps Our Enemies and Threatens Our Freedoms, where he writes this. First of all, Don Lemon's question caught me off guard because, hello, I'm a human rights lawyer, his emphasis. I've spent my entire career fighting for values that are antithetical to those of the ruthless terror group. Second, as millions of CNN viewers who watched my interview that evening can vouch, I had devoted nearly the entire interview, almost five minutes out of a total six, categorically condemning that morning's Paris terrorist attack using the most vehement terms that can be found in the English language today. So yeah, it's kind of a dumb question to ask. And it's not just because the answer is so glaringly obvious, but because any white Christian human rights lawyer on the planet would not be asked this question in a million years. And, and yeah, in the following days and weeks, a lot of people and, and publications let Don Lemon have it for being kind of a weirdo in this interview. But honestly, I, I don't think that Don Lemon is a dumb person. You know, I think he was trying to ask a provocative question that would get ratings for CNN. And you know, at least on that front, it worked. But the more problematic component of the question is that it assumes that Iftikhar himself is, you know, if not more morally culpable, is at least in some way more connected to the terrorist attack that took place in Paris in 2015, simply because he's a Muslim. But that leap of logic, that, that idea that because a terrible crime was committed by an individual Muslim, that, that we can infer that all Muslims must be violent criminals to be feared, is all too familiar in our society and even in our churches. You know, it's all too common an experience to hear this kind of anti-Muslim fear-mongering rhetoric from both our pulpits and in our pews. I mean, these views are kind of everywhere and they're definitely worth examining and picking apart. So let's get started. So I think a good place to start here is to look at the enormous double standard when it comes to the media's portrayal of Islam and violence. Like later on in his book, Iftikhar writes this. When Christians commit acts of terror, we don't ask priests and pastors to go on national television to condemn these acts. But sadly, Muslim public intellectuals, thinkers, leaders, and Islamic scholars have that double standard that they have to deal with. I think it's important to keep in mind that bringing religion into it at all is actually serving the purposes of the terrorists. He goes on to cite the work of Professor Juan Cole of the University of Michigan, and he's taken up the same theme. The double standard applies to acts of terrorism committed by professed Muslims and those carried out by Christians. Oklahoma City bombers Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols would never be called Christian terrorists, even though they were in close contact with the Christian identity movement. No one would speak of Christo-fascism or Judeo-fascism 
fascism as a Republican speak of Islamofascism. In fact, it was persons of Christian heritage who invented fascism, not Muslims. You know, I think a lot of American Christians have this association between Islam and terrorism largely because of this double standard, as well as a few other reasons that we'll get into in a bit. But, but when we exist in a media environment where violence committed by Muslims is more often than not labeled terrorism, and equally destructive violence committed by white Christians is usually labeled as a lone wolf attack or, or it's simply attributed to the mental health problems of a single individual, even when those individuals have explicit ties to white supremacist or Christianist groups. Terrorism at its core is the use of violence or intimidation to achieve some social or political aim. And note that that definition says nothing about the perpetrator's religion or ethnic background, but we still have trouble applying that label to people that we see as being in one of our own groups, even if it's the label that makes the most sense. We're way less likely to say that it's an issue with Christianity in general or a problem with all white people because we know better. We know that that explanation doesn't make sense. And yet, when that same logic is applied the other way around, we don't often have the same incredulity that we should have. I mean, just think about it. There are around 1.8 billion Muslims on the planet right now, and the vast, vast majority of them obviously abhor violence. And anyone who thinks that you can just say that all of those billions of human beings share some single essential trait is just flat out wrong and frankly lazy. Comparing all Muslims to the extremists who make up organizations like ISIS is like comparing all Christians to a Christianist ideology identity movement like the KKK. We just know that that isn't the case. The fact of the matter is that the vast majority of Muslims and Muslim organizations denounce this kind of violence all the time. And I'll, I'll still hear complaints sometimes from people who are like, you know, why aren't there more moderate Muslims denouncing acts of violence? And I have to say, you know, if you're complaining that you're not hearing enough denunciations, then you're just not listening. You know, in fact, an American Muslim student was tired of hearing that exact complaint from people who, you know, I guess haven't heard of Google, <laughs> that he made a spreadsheet containing thousands and thousands of denunciations in the form of articles, tweets, press releases from Muslims denouncing terror attacks. And I'll go ahead and link that list in the description if you're curious. But I think that this is just one of the fundamental flaws of human cognition. You know, when we think about people who we perceive to be a part of our group, we think of them as being more three-dimensional, more fleshed out and nuanced, more more human. But when we think of someone who we perceive to be outside that group, maybe a foreigner or a practitioner of another faith, for example, we fall back on stereotypes. People outside the group are seen as more similar to each other than people inside the group who are all you know, unique individuals. People outside the group become just cardboard cutouts, flat, two-dimensional simplifications of the people that they truly are. But I think that for Christians, if, if we're really going to love our neighbors, we have to do the mental work to see all people as people, unique and loved by God. We have to afford them the same nuance and, and personhood that we would ascribe to our own family members. And that's really only just the start. So one wonders how Islamophobic ideas persist in communities that value the teachings of Jesus. And sadly, it becomes less and less of a mystery when we stop to examine the quality, or lack thereof in many cases, of Christian leadership on this issue. We have Christian leaders like Franklin Graham, son of the famous evangelist Billy Graham, and a leader in the Southern Baptist Convention saying things like, Islam is a very wicked religion on national television. He's also made the claim that, that Islam teaches that the only way that you can attain salvation is through dying in a holy war. And obviously this, of course, is a lie. I mean, it's not actually what Muslims believe. And, you know, like I'm assuming that Graham has access to the internet and can verify if a statement like that is true before saying it, but he didn't. 
I mean, this is a guy who's opposed Muslim Americans running for office. He's opposed building mosques for Muslims to worship in and, and is apparently perfectly fine with spreading lies about the religion to his followers. And you have to wonder, I mean, what good does he think he's actually doing here? But he's far from the only Christian leader who's gotten in on the anti-Muslim rhetoric. Pat Robertson, host of the 700 Club, once described Islam saying that it isn't a religion as such, it's actually a political system that is bent on dominating you and killing you. And I'm like, which is it, Pat? You know, they can't really dominate you if they've already killed you, but anyway. So yeah, there's a lot wrong with those kinds of statements and it definitely distorts Islam into this evil boogeyman, but I think it also actually distorts Christianity as well. They kind of just define Christianity as another in-group that you can be in. You know, it's Christianity as just another method of othering people. And that's just a terrible way to think about religion in general. I mean, religion shouldn't be just the place that you go to to learn who you should hate and fear. But there's already a lot of misinformation floating around about Islam, especially in evangelical circles, and we really don't need more voices out there parroting these distorted views. You know, it's like in our last episode, we talked about how early Christians were actually accused of cannibalism, you know, because there were these rumors going around about how they would eat the body and, and drink the blood of a guy called Jesus. And this rumor was apparently pretty common, even though it had almost no basis in reality. People just repeated it because it reinforced their already negative view of Christians. And now it's Christians who are doing the same thing to other religions. But that's just how this stuff spreads. You know, you have people who are gullible enough to believe this stuff or people who, you know, don't really care whether it's true or not. And then you also have people who just hate Muslims and will spread any misinformation so long as it hurts them. And I just think that we don't want to find ourselves in any of those categories. But the sad thing is that this is really only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to anti-Islamic sentiments on the internet. You know, it won't take you long to find way worse stuff here on YouTube even, or on Twitter, Reddit, 4chan, whatever. Um, there's just so much fear that, you know, we're going to need to overcome if we want to tackle this issue. So we're actually kind of running out of time here already, and uh, there's still so much that I want to discuss on this topic. So we're going to go ahead and split this episode up into two parts. And so we'll be back next week with the rest of it. But if there's one thought that, that I could leave you with for now, you know, it's that far too often we as Christians define ourselves by, by what we fear, fear of of change, fear of uncertainty, of, of a world that is increasingly unfamiliar. And I think the tragedy here is that we miss out on some of the beautiful parts of our faith. The, the, the positive aspects of who we are get left by the wayside as we constantly focus on keeping our guard up. You know, I just think that, that human beings are actually less loving when we're scared. And you know, that's a big problem when your entire religion is centered around love. You know, we're told that our God is love. We're told that, you know, even if we think that we're right all the time, even if we think that we've solved all of the mysteries of the universe and we've, we've plumbed the depths of human knowledge, in the end, if we forget to love others, then it's not worth anything. It's just noise. And I think that part of our calling is to be more than that, to be, to be light, to love others unconditionally, to be patient and, and kind and humble and selfless. And if we're gonna really do that, if we're really going to make an attempt to make that kind of love central to who we are, we're going to need to not let fear drive us. So let's let ourselves just imagine what that could look like as we interact with and, and try to love those of other faiths. Let's let ourselves Imagine what happens when, when our Christianity inspires us to love people of different backgrounds and creeds. And let's just see where that takes us.
Thank you so much for watching this episode of Halidom. Um, as always, we're glad that you're here. Um, if you like the video, uh, please leave a like. It really helps us out. And if you like these songs that we've been doing at the end, um, please let us know. I've also been kind of posting those as their own separate video, so you can check that out. There's a Halidom playlist called Halidom Music. And also, uh, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. I mean, it really helps out the channel. And uh, if you wanna see more videos like this, that's the best way to do it. But that's all I've got for you for now. Uh, I'll see you next week with part two. Bye.